Understanding Vision by David O. Oyedepo. Introduction The word vision is so grossly misunderstood today in the church that virtually every dream of the night is mistaken for a vision. On the other hand, the spiritualists use vision as the principal bait to get followers. Their prophets claim to see visions for people. Thus, multitudes today are chasing after shadows through their traps. The question then is, what is vision? Is it what transpires in a trance or what obtains in one form of ecstasy or the other? The subject of vision is very crucial in one's success in life. The word says, where there is no vision, the people perish. Proverbs 29 verse 18. The word perish here does not mean to die physically. From the original Greek text, it means to be stripped of honor and dignity. We conclude, therefore, that vision is the pathway to honor and dignity. Thus, through the pages of this book, we will explore the great asset called vision. Knowing where you are going and what to do to get there generates confidence. The confident ones are the strong ones in the kingdom. They are men of extraordinary strength and exploits. These are the visionaries who have sought God and received his plans for their lives. They know where they are heading to and they know their end from their beginning. They have a solid grip of their end and have an understanding of how to get there. Their confidence knows no barrier because they run like horsemen and leap like chariots. One word comes to mind at their appearance, warriors. Their faces are set before them. Their eyes are fixed on a particular target in the future. They neither turn to the right nor to the left. To them, the sword is a plaything. Pestilence does not hold them bound. Farming does not know their address. Their presence sets confusion into the camp of their enemies. They are mighty men of exploits and the men of valor. Before, they were ordinary men, but now they are extraordinary men. Their status changed when they laid hold of an extraordinary vision from God and dared to step out. They stepped out with their vision in sight and God inside them. In other words, they know their visions and they know their God. When you know God, you lay hold on strength. And when you have strength, you do exploits. One of the most unpleasant situations witnessed in life is seeing believers not attaining their extraordinary status in Christ Jesus. I delved into this problem and discovered that the reason for their pitiable condition is ignorance. As it is written, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because thou hast rejected knowledge. Hosea 4 verse 6. This is why the Holy Ghost led me to write this book. I pray that its purpose will be fulfilled in your life. As you read in Jesus' name, Amen. Chapter 1. What is vision? Vision in this context means to see ahead. It is the ability to have a pre-knowledge of an upcoming event. It is interesting to know that God has a plan for his people, both as a church and as individuals. We serve a decent and orderly God. He is no author of confusion, but a God of plans and purposes. When he created the first man, he had a reason for it and had an assignment for him to carry out. He was to dress the garden and keep it. 
he was the king of Eden, and because he is the same yesterday, today, and forever, Hebrews 13 verse 8, he still has drawn out plans for every man on earth today, particularly the saints. Remember, we are told that all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. John 1 verse 3. This explains that Christ is the force behind creation. The Almighty God said about himself, I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. Malachi 3 verse 6 All through scriptures we see God's plans unfold to his people. It is important to understand that we have a predestination in God. Therefore, we are not creatures of chance, but of destiny, because we serve a God of plans and purposes. Concerning Jeremiah, God said, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee, and before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Jeremiah 1 verse 5. Apostle Paul also said that God separated him from his mother's womb. He said, For when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace. Galatians 1 verse 15. God still separates people today from their mother's wombs. We must understand that our journey to destiny began at salvation as it was with paul his journey began when he acknowledged the lordship of christ we are born to fulfill a particular course and the discovery of that course is called vision therefore vision can be defined as the unfolding of a divine plan as it relates to a nation a group of people or an individual. The unfolding of God's plan for us is the beginning of our great future and stardom in the kingdom. We can never become stars until we operate within the scope of God's plan for our lives. Every believer has a peculiar plan and function which was assigned to him before he was born. From the scripture, we understand that we are members of a spiritual body. Now we are the body of Christ and members in particular. 1 Corinthians 12 verse 27 Thus, every member has a function to perform. As members of the body, we are stewards with particular functions. And God expects us to carry out these functions wholeheartedly. This is a ministry and it is also stewardship. Ministry is occupying your position as assigned by God. It is not limited to the pulpit. Have you ever come across a body which is just one big eye? Or one which is just one big mouth? No! A body is made up of different members. Each member has a particular function and they all work together to build up the body. Thus, ministry is carrying out a divine assignment. For instance, Joseph had a divine task. He was sent to Egypt to preserve lives. Gideon was not called to preach but to deliver the Israelites. Abraham was called to be established as an institution through which the families of the earth will be blessed. It is important to note that callings and elections are not limited to preaching. We are called to specific divine assignments and the discovery of this function is called vision. Vision is a divine insight into God's plan for us, and the pursuit of this vision is called a ministry. We can conclude thus, no vision, no ministry. Therefore, 
We have a ministry and it is our duty to discover it. Just like Prophet Habakkuk, we must stand upon our watch to see what God has in store for us. We must be visionaries because only visionaries become great in the kingdom. It is important that we locate our purposes and begin to actualize it because our future depends on the discovery of those functions. However, no calling is of a low status as every calling and function is of a high status and must culminate in glory. For instance, every member of a king's body has royal aroma. We cannot say of the hand, this is only a hand, it is not the king, so it has no honor. Every part of the king is the king and must be accorded the respect and honor due to it. So is it with every member of the body of Christ. Every function you are ordained to carry out leads to honor, dignity, and stardom. The importance of vision. Vision is very important in a believer's life because it puts an end to a life of struggles. That means when we don't discover God's plan, we will keep struggling. God only enables us to perform in the area he has assigned us to serve. This is where we make it effortlessly smiling all the way. Vision gives stability to our lives. It helps us to know where we are heading for. We have a goal and aim for it with strong purposeful strides, not as one beating the air. It's changes our attitudes and actions. Others might bow with any wind of doctrine. They might do whatever they like and even succeed greatly in those things. But none of those things will move you. Your vision prevents you from going anywhere you like or following after what others are doing. It gives you a definite focus. It gives you the consciousness of one on a divine mission. The truth is that only visionaries will be enlisted into God's army. There will be men who know where they are going and go about it with the strength of a horse. Remember, a man on foot cannot compete with the one on a horse. Vision gives you a horse to ride on. The prophet Joel tells us about the end time army of God. The appearance of them is as the appearance of horses and as horsemen so shall they run. Joel 2 verse 4 This army is made up of men with specific missions whose faces will be set only towards accomplishing these missions. They shall not collide with each other. Each one shall follow his own calling, working separately towards one goal, yet together. They shall run like mighty men. They shall climb the wall like men of war. And they shall march, each one on his ways. And they shall not break their ranks. Neither shall one trust another. They shall walk everyone in his path. And when they fall upon the sword, they shall not be wounded. Joel 2 verse 7 to 8. These are visionary men who will show forth the glory of God this end time. No man gives himself a vision. Every true vision comes from God. However, it is important that we draw a line between vision and ambition. Vision is God-given while ambition is man-made. Vision is from above while ambition has its origin on earth. Ambition is born out of an earthly drive to do things better than others. It springs mostly out of envy and a desire for power and self-recognition. These desires run so deep that men fix their eyes on their targets go all out for them 
employing all manner of evil imaginations. Men driven by their ambition can kill, destroy nations and cities just to achieve their goal. For instance, Hitler was a man driven by his own earthly ambition. He wanted to rule the world. He also wanted Germany to rule the whole world and felt that the Jews stood in the way. This brought about the devilish idea of exterminating the Jews. Hitler had an ambition and nothing was too evil for him to do in order to achieve it. The great man of faith, George Muller, had a vision, a heavenly dream. He wanted to put a smile on the faces of all the orphans left after the war. He gave up everything he had to start an orphanage, looking unto God alone. He never had to steal, kill, defraud, or beg for sustenance. He was an ordinary man who had an extraordinary task and dared to step out in faith. This is a vision from God. God gives the vision and enables the visionary to bring it to function. No one places himself in an office. God is the one who assigns offices to his children as he pleases. He has absolute prerogative in the placement of his people. As God has set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers after that miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. 1 Corinthians 12 verse 28. Ephesians 4 11 also emphasizes this point. It says, And he gave some apostles, and some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. God does the placement and leaves it with the minister to either make good use of his calling or go to sleep with it. He gives a task and accompanies it with grace for its accomplishment. When he gives, he never takes back. For the gates and calling of God are without repentance. Romans 11 verse 29 Qualification for Placement it is important that we do not mistake natural qualities for divine placement. God's placements are by grace and election, not expertise or strength. God wanted someone to bring out his people from Egypt and he chose Moses, a stammerer. When he needed a man to build the walls of Jerusalem, he saw no one within the city of Jerusalem. He chose a slave boy in exile. Nehemiah, for ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and base things of the world and things which are despised has God chosen, yea, and things which are not to bring to not things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 26 to 29 Our natural capabilities cannot qualify us for divine tasks. Divine assignments require divine strength and divine strength can only be made perfect in weakness. It is written, my strength is made perfect in weakness. 2 Corinthians 12 verse 9 Eliab, Jesus' first son, had all the natural qualities of a king, but the same qualities brought about his disqualification before God. David, on the other hand, was considered to be naturally unqualified. He was not even called out with the other sons. However, his natural disqualification qualified him for a divine assignment. We should not think that our eloquence or high educational background is the reason why God has called us into preaching ministry. 
if natural qualifications were to be considered, I would have been the most unlikely candidate for a preaching ministry. I was very slow-tongued and sickly, but God called me and that made the difference. God will always call us in our weaknesses so that we can rely on his strength for his assignment and get to know him. When we know God, we lay hold on divine strength. And when we have divine strength, we do exploits in our divine assignments. A vision can be oral, pictorial, or both. Either way, it is a spiritual language through which God transmits his plans to chosen vessels. A dream is not a vision. But a vision can be communicated to you according to your level of comprehension. It might be through words or images. Images give us what to fix our eyes on. This is especially useful in moments of discouragement. During such moments, we can switch our minds back to the images we received in the vision and we are encouraged today all over the world an increasing number of people are coming up with one vision or the other some are genuine others need to be passed more closely through god's light while some others need to be dumped in the trash can as you read on the holy spirit will open your eyes to know where your vision belongs as you grasp a better understanding of visions for effectual implementation. Chapter 2 The God Appointed Vision I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower and will watch to see what he will say unto me and what I shall answer when I am reproved. And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain upon tables, that he may run that readeth it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. Habakkuk 2 verse 1 to 3 The prize for every high calling of God is a crown of enthronement. Therefore, we owe ourselves the responsibility of ascertaining the genuineness of our vision before launching out in its pursuit. Therefore, in this chapter, we will focus on how to determine a genuine vision. One major characteristic of a genuine vision is that it has its source in God. It is God's revealed plan and has to be traceable to him. Any vision that does not have its source in God leads to destruction. It might flourish for a while, but destruction is inevitable. Absalom, the son of David, so much desired to become king that he couldn't even wait for his father to die. His comportment and appearance gained the people's approval. Being pushed on by his own selfish vision and the people's, he declared himself king. His vision was not from God. For a while it was sweet, but sudden destruction caught up with him. Remember, every vision not from God leads to destruction. For instance, a young man serving under a man of God suddenly thinks he can do it better and becomes very critical of the existing authority. He tries all he can to show people how gifted he is. He gets encouragement from some quarters and is pushed on to break away from his parent ministry. He proclaims he has a vision. This vision is surely not from God, for God does not encourage break away. Take a cue from King David. He had a divine calling and was anointed king in place of Saul. 
But as long as Saul was alive, he never sought to take the throne. He only ran away when it became apparent that his life was in danger. A vision that is of God will not encourage divisions and break away. So watch it. It's high time we put a stop to break away and factions in our churches. When our vision is of God, he will create a peaceful way out for us in his own time. Furthermore, every God-given vision is characterized by peace because vision and peace are covenant partners. A vision without rest should be re-examined. Abraham was an addicted visionary. For 25 years, he held on to his vision, the promise of a son. He was at peace. He staggered not at the promise of God. Romans 4 verse 20. A vision which has God as its source has peace as its companion. God will always speak peace to his people. I will hear what God the Lord will speak. For he will speak peace unto his people and to his saints. Psalm 85 verse 8. A vision is given in response to a heart desire which leads to inquiry and inquiry leads to acquiring. Through desire a man having separated himself seeket an intermediate with all wisdom. Proverbs 18 verse 1. A vision is sought for and acquired by man. Everyone through separation seeks his own vision. No one can seek a vision for another person. The prophet Habakkuk says, I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower and will watch to see what he will say unto me and what I will answer when I am reproved. And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain upon tables, that he may run that readeth it. Habakkuk 2 verse 1 to 2. Vision is an individual, personal affair, not a collective one. This is seen in the repeated use of the first person pronoun in the above text. A man who desires a vision and wisdom must of necessity separate himself from every distraction to make inquiries from God, ascertaining our area. Genuine visions are plain. Make it plain upon the tables. They clearly state what to do, when to do it, where to do it, and how to go about it. I have seen a lot of preachers coming up to claim they have received visions from God. But when asked what that vision is, they say, God has sent me to preach the Bible. This normally amuses me because God can never send an individual to preach the whole Bible. We are too small to preach the entire Bible. The Bible is loaded with substance. A vision from God will point us to the specific substance we are to preach. When the Lord called me into ministry, he made the vision plain before me. Go forth and liberate my people from all oppressions of the devil through the preaching of the word of faith. This was plain. The job was to liberate the people of God, and the tool for this liberation was the word of faith. A vision is a specific task assigned and revealed to an individual by God. If you are still prowling around, claiming that God has called you to preach the whole Bible, it's time to change your thinking. You need to get back to God and ask for your specific assignment. Visions are plain. This is why great men of God today are identified with specific clear callings. 
for one man of God it is salvation, for another it is faith and healing, yet for another it is prosperity. God is not an author of confusion. When he calls us, he makes our callings plain. Zeal. A God-given vision always imparts a divine drive in the beneficiary, which drives him to accomplishment. This divine drive is called zeal. Zeal is that inward excitement that pushes us towards accomplishing our mission. When the zeal of God consumes us, every other factor becomes secondary. God cannot call us to a task without giving us the zeal to perform it. The time element. Timing is very important in God's program. A vision from God must have time element. There is always a time for takeoff. For instance, John the Baptist was on a divine mission. It had been said of him that even before he was born, he would prepare the way of the Lord. He knew it, but he didn't go about it immediately until he came to the fullness of age. He waited for God's time. The Bible says, And the child grew and waxed strong in spirit, and was in the desert till the day of his showing unto Israel. Luke 1 verse 80 Jesus also knew his mission, but he waited for 30 years, carrying out menial jobs before finally launching out. The time God calls us to ministry is not necessarily the time to step out. Always get God's appointed time and walk in it. A vision does not become a ministry until it is pursued. The pursuit of a God-given vision is what is called a ministry. That he may run that readeth it. Habakkuk 2 verse 2. If our vision must be accomplished, we must run with it and pursue it. Every calling of God culminates in glory, but there is a demand to press. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Philippians 3 verse 14 There is of necessity a press attached to every prize. No press, no prize. Paul had a vision. So he ran, pressed, and fought. So run, press on. Don't go about minding other people's ministries. God has not called you to be a referee. Referees don't win prizes. We must be less concerned about how others are pursuing their visions and have a sense of mission to effectively pursue ours. Great success is attained through diligent pursuit. We can't succeed by accident, but by a conscious pursuit of our vision. That is, doing what it takes to get to where we are going. We must pursue our vision if we are to receive our crowns. We can't get the juice out of an orange without squeezing it. So press on and obtain your prize. The vision we don't pursue cannot be fulfilled. A vision that will not be realized is one whose challenges we don't rise up to. We must get on our feet and arise to the challenges of our vision. A speaking force. A genuine vision speaks at the end. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. Habakkuk 2 verse 3 The source of any vision is made apparent for all to see at the end. It speaks louder than words. If it is God, its good fruit will be made manifest for all to see. If it is not God, its bad fruit will also be shown to all. A vision is like a seed. 
whose full dignity only emerges at the end. At the end, it shall speak by an abundant harvest, if well nourished and cared for. A grain of wheat does not become a full corn overnight. It matures in stages until it is ready for harvest. And he said, So is the kingdom of God, as if a man should cast seed into the ground, and should sleep and rise night and day, and the seed should spring and grow up. He knoweth not how, for the earth bringeth forth fruits of herself, first the blade, then the ear, after that the full corn in the ear. But when the fruit is brought forth, immediately he put it in the sickle, because the harvest is come. Mark 4 verse 26 to 29. A vision is like a seed which produces if pursued. The full corn does not appear at once. It takes time. The source of a vision will not be a hidden secret after its execution. Surely the vision will speak and not lie. Chapter 3 Securing a Vision Vision gives direction to life because God's path for us is in the vision He gives. Without vision, we cannot get our bearings right. We must get our vision, locate our place in God, and let the light of God shine on our paths. How then do we secure a vision? Genuine visions come from God, yet man has a part to play. A man who seeks a vision must stretch out his hands to God to receive it. Just as the man who desires the gift of salvation steps out, and confesses the lordship of Jesus. Likewise, the visionary has to step out and call on the name of the Lord. There is a separation and an asking involved, be it revelation or salvation. They only come to those who call on his name. In this chapter, we will examine what this stepping out involves realizing our needs god cannot supply what we don't need he will only supply all our needs according to his riches in glory philippians 4 verse 19 only a fool will despise the need for a vision because the word of god clearly spells out the consequence for the lack of it. Where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. Proverbs 29 verse 18. Lack of vision can bring regret to a whole generation, and it can lead to the destruction of the saints of God. There is need for every believer to have a vision. It is not God's wish that anyone should perish. He wants everyone to get to their promised land and only vision can take us there. However, if we desire to enter our promised land and possess our possessions, we need a genuine vision from God. Vision is the gateway to greatness in the kingdom and it makes a man. Let us see what happened to one of our covenant fathers. All his life, Jacob had been a trickster and a usurper until he had an encounter with God at Bethel on his way to meet Laban. This was the turning point of his life. The usurper died. The trickster was buried in a covenant with God, and a new life began. He arrived at Laban's place without a vision, but he had a determination to live right. However, this was not enough. For 14 years, he sweated and labored for the woman he loved. 
he was cheated and subjected to slavery. At the end of 14 years, he had no substance, no future, but only two wives and a battalion of children to show for his sweat. Then he remembered his covenant with God. He asked and received a terrific insight into cattle rearing, which he promptly put to work. He pursued it and he prospered. The scripture says in Genesis 30 verse 43 that, And the man increased exceedingly and had much cattle and made servants and men servants and camels and asses. The potential for greatness was in him. But until he saw the need for insight into the ways of God, he never received it. Vision brings about positive covenant changes in our lives when we see the need for it and are prepared to receive it. See God's willingness to reveal his plan. God is always willing to reveal his plans. He didn't make his plans for himself. He made them for us. He devised them so that through them we can arise as stars and bring about the reestablishment of his kingdom on earth. I use the word reestablishment because Adam transferred the dominion of the earth to Satan at the fall. God is eager to see the reestablishment of his power and authority on earth. This explains why his eagerness to reveal his plans to us knows no limit. I am the Lord thy God which teacheth thee to profit, which leadeth thee by the way that thou shouldest go. Isaiah 48 verse 17 God has taken upon himself the responsibility to lead us into our destinies. How does he do this? By revealing his plans and showing us our own portion in his master plan. It was specially designed for us, so we must go for it. God is eager to show us. He is just waiting for that moment when we will step out to receive it. Seek God in prayer. Prayer draws the hand of God into a situation. It is the link that connects man to the throne room of God. If we want to know the ways of God in any situation, we must pray and ask. The man Daniel was a man of visions and revelations. He was also a man of prayer. He received his vision and revelations through the instrumentality of prayer. A time came when he discovered the set time for the captivity of Israel. He then took it upon himself to seek the face of God in prayer concerning the restoration of Jerusalem. He prayed and God released his plan to him in a vision. See Daniel 9. God only reveals his plans to those who ask him. If we don't ask, we will not receive. Prayer is a means of receiving God's plans. Speaking through prophet Jeremiah, God said, Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and shew thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Jeremiah 33 verse 3 Every showing and every vision from God must be preceded by a call. No call, no show. The word show talks about revelation concerning us as contained in God's plan. This can only be unveiled to us through prayer. This call resounds all over the scripture. God is saying, call on me, ask of me, etc. So ask and receive so that your joy may be full. Be watchful. Visions are received during watchful moments. You make yourself available to receive God's plan through watching. The prophet Habakkuk said, 
I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower and will watch to see what he will say unto me and what I shall answer when I am reproved. Habakkuk 2 verse 1 Watching and praying are two different things, but the two go hand in hand. Prayer is calling upon God while watching is conditioning our spirit man to receive from him. It involves getting our spirit man linked with heaven in order to receive signals. Prophet Habakkuk prayed to God and then set himself to watch and see what God will say. He had to quit praying to watch. Most people who talk about receiving God's plan did so in moments of watchfulness. God's plan could be revealed to us at any time while going about our daily affairs, while driving etc. As long as our spirit man is tuned to receiving from God, his glorious plan will drop into it. Then light, which cannot be denied, will come vividly and in reality. The vision for this ministry was received through watchfulness. It happened when I had a nudge to visit some old friends. I got to their house only to discover that they had moved. I wasn't happy to have gone all the way in vain as I turned to go back. The Holy Ghost said to me, All things work together to the advantage of them that love the Lord. It was a sweet and relaxing flash into my spirit man which I could have missed if I were not watchful, but I caught it. That word was undoubtedly from God. I didn't hear the interpretation of that verse before then. All things work together to the advantage. Romans 8 verse 28. It was clearly and vividly put. I repeated it and told myself that the situation was to my advantage and watched for further instructions which came shortly. The Holy Ghost told me to go to a quiet place for a private discussion with him. So I checked into a hotel, knelt down, and started praying. In the course of that prayer session, an 18-hour vision concerning this ministry was delivered to me. Being watchful is very important if you want to receive from God. You may pray all you want. But if you are not watchful, you will miss your vision very often. Spiritual truths are sent forth as tiny seeds that can be ignored if one is not watchful. So watch and lay hold on God's plan for your life. Chapter 4 Proving the Vision A vision that is not proved must not be pursued. A word not tested is not to be relied on. There is a path God has prepared for everyone born of him. He forbids anyone to turn from his path either to the right or to the left. Our success in life depends on how well we keep to this path. When we stay away from the path of God, we are always to blame. God holds us responsible. The devil might have beguiled us. We might have been pushed on by people, but the blame is always ours. This is because we have authority over the devil and all external influences. For instance, the devil beguiled if through his subtlety, but Eve was punished. This calls for caution in our eagerness to hear words or revelations from people. I have seen believers lured away from their calling all because they received a word from someone. Before we start running with any word we receive, we should subject it to 
thorough examination. Check its accuracy. Sieve off the unwanted elements and hold on to the substance. The word of God had to be tried, not once, but seven times. The words of the Lord are pure words, a silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Psalm 12 verse 6. If the word of God could be subjected to a test, then every vision or revelation must be properly scrutinized. God has sounded the instruction. There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Proverbs 14 verse 12 Do you know that the devil himself can appear as an angel of light? Don't go running with just anything you receive. Prove it first. But how do we determine the accuracy of a vision? Through the word. God's word is the only authentic tool for proving a vision. When we receive a vision, we should illuminate our spirit through God's word for a backing before we step out. By so doing, we have the double assurance that it is from God because he will only back up what he says. A young pastor was praying one day in his house when he heard from God that you are the Elijah who is to come before the Savior comes back. He seemed so good and real and he was excited. Then he thought came that he should get a scriptural backing for the revelation. He went into God's word and he got to the place where Jesus told his disciples that Elijah had already come in the person of John the Baptist. He went to his pastor for more illumination and he was told the same thing. Then he knew that the vision he received was not from God. The devil knows scriptures and quotes them to confuse us. Jesus, the son of God, was faced with this trick of the devil on the mountain of temptation. The devil quoted scriptures to him, but he was not moved because he had the right scriptures to set him on the run. Before pursuing any revelation, first get into the word of God for proofs. Compare scripture with scripture and unravel the truth behind the vision. Identify the personality behind the voice. The atmosphere is full of voices and since vision involves communication, it becomes necessary to ascertain the personality behind the voices we hear. Not all voices are God's. There is the voice of God, the voice of our spirit man, and that of the devil. Only one of them is reliable and dependable, and that is the voice of God. I once heard something, and I thought it was from God. The Lord questioned me about it, and I reminded him that was what he said. But he told me, no, that was the voice of your spirit man. You heard yourself. The voice of our spirit man is not absolutely reliable. It may be biased because it might have some elements of carnality in it. This is where we must be vigilant. We might be able to detect the devil's voice easily, but our own voice is not that easily identified. Why? The ways of a man always seems right in his own eyes. So to us, our voice always seems to be saying the correct thing. The way that seems right to you is the way of your own voice. While on a trip to Damascus, Saul, Paul, and his team were struck by the power of God. 
the voice of the Lord came to him. He identified it and asked, Who art thou, Lord? Acts 9 verse 5. Now others heard the voice, but they had no idea who was speaking. It is important that we identify the voice behind our vision so as not to be led into error. Ascertain the content of your vision. The content of every vision has to be ascertained. There is need to get a good understanding of the content of our vision before we start to run with it. God has no pleasure in our confusion. He's excited at directing us. We should get back to him with our vision, asking for further illumination on each item. As we engage with him, he will sort out everything. We must learn to ask God for complete illumination into a vision. His assurance and further revelation will give us the courage to run with it effectively. We should commit a vision and revelation to God in prayer. The prayer force involved here is a prayer of commitment. The word of God says, Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. Psalm 37 verse 5 After I was called into ministry, I needed some clarification, so I took the matter to God. I asked, Lord, are you asking me to start an independent ministry or to serve under an existing one? All I wanted was his will. I committed my ways to him and relaxed. Then I received the answer that I was to start off a new ministry. At a time, we were to set up the operation headquarters of the ministry and Ilori looked very attractive. As far as I was concerned, it was the ideal spot. However, my wife and I committed the matter to God, ready to obey whatever he would say. And the Lord said, Arise, go to Damascus. The Lord made it plain that Damascus stood for Kaduna, the city of persecution. Therefore, when we got to Kaduna, witnessing Islamic uprising was no news to me. I was well acquainted with my role in it. No force on earth could stop me from playing my part because this was what I was anointed for. God's voice helps you to operate under an extraordinary confidence. Friends, we must be inquisitive about our visions. Ask God about everything up to the tiniest details. Get him to give you a good understanding of the contents of the vision before stepping out. When Moses was called to go and deliver the Israelites from Egypt, he asked all manner of questions. There was no question he did not ask for proofs and he got them. He asked for a mouth and he got one. Moses got a better understanding of his mission and how to go about it by asking God questions. Thus, we must ask so as to receive direction. The prayer of inquiry offers direction. We need God's direction in every venture we are embarking on. When we ask him for direction, by committing our ways to him, he will direct our paths. He knows the end from the beginning and before him all things lay bare. Greater exploits in ministry are a function of the accuracy of the content of our vision. God's voice offers strength which leads to exploits. Things to guard against. There are however certain things we must guard against. They include places we must not 
ask God for direction with fleeces. This involves saying something like this, Father, if I go to see my pastor and the first thing he tells me is Jesus loves you, then I know you have called me to work unto him. We cannot use this method to get clarification on our vision. The word of God says that as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God, not as many as are led by fleeces. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Romans 8 verse 14. You may argue that Gideon did this and it worked for him. Yes, but Gideon was under the old covenant and they had no indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. We are of the new covenant and have the Spirit of God in us. So ask him for illumination. In the next chapter, we will further examine the Holy Spirit and his role in visions. People's Confirmation we must also guard against people's confirmation. This is not wrong in itself. God can use people to help us, but a lot of them will end up leading us to confusion. When I received my vision to go into ministry, I told the great man of God about it. However, he told me God had not called me. If I had not heard God clearly, this would have sent me off the track. But I heard God and I stuck to my calling. Nehemiah could not have succeeded in his mission if he had revealed it to people for confirmation. He did the service by himself and gave the people information on what they were to do. If he had asked for their advice, he would have been led off his path. When we look unto God alone, he will verify our vision for us. There was a time that I thought a successful ministry was only possible in America. I decided to start off the ministry there. I was looking to America instead of God. And he told me, son, you have two eyes. Can you make one look up and the other one look down at the same time? I wondered what he meant, so I tried it and I couldn't. Then the message sank in. I can't look up to God and America at the same time. Successful ministries are founded in God not in America. Beloved, look up to God and hear his voice. He alone is able to lead you in the path he has chosen for you. The acid test for a genuine vision. As earlier mentioned, God has commanded us to prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. First Thessalonians 5 verse 21 all things including visions this signifies that not all visions are true we are also told that there are two voices clamoring for man's attention the voice of the shepherd god and that of the stranger and when he puts forth his own ship he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. John 10 verse 4 to 5 Since there are voices, there must also be a way of knowing which one is genuine and which is counterfeit. Here is the simple proof. The word of God says, I will hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace unto his people and to his saints. 
but let them not turn again to folly. Psalm 85 verse 8. Therefore, peace is the proof of a genuine vision. God, the good shepherd, always leads beside the still waters. Still waters connote peace and rest. If a vision is truly of God, it will be accompanied with peace. Whenever the peace of God eludes a believer in the pursuit of a purported vision, there is need to check it. This is the simple reason. Except God is actually involved, no vision can be accomplished. In Zechariah 4 verse 6, it is stated regarding the vision of Zerubbabel, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. This is reiterated in Psalm 127 verse 1. Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. What more shall we say? For by strength shall no man prevail. First Samuel 2 verse 9. The master himself concludes it with a seal of finality thus. Without me ye can do nothing. John 15 verse 5. It is clearly evident from the above scriptures that every vision requires the direct involvement and intervention of God to be accomplished and fulfilled. We are told that faithful is he that calleth you, who also will do it. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 24 In the final analysis, it is God who works in a vessel to accomplish the vision he gives. It is God which walketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Philippians 2 verse 13 However, if God must work in us, we must necessarily be at rest. We have this blessed assurance in the word that we need not do otherwise for the Lord will fight for you while you hold your peace Exodus 14 verse 14 paraphrased if God must take over man must hold his peace God does not take over our battles and pursuits until we hold our peace you may ask but why? It is because he does not share his glory with anyone. My glory will I not give to another. Isaiah 42 verse 8. Also that no flesh my glory in his presence. More importantly, we are admonished. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the hidden. I will be exalted in the earth. Psalm 46 verse 10. This is the truth until we are at rest. God cannot be at work. If we must see God at work, then we have to be at rest. This is the secret behind the peace that attends to all heaven-born visions. With peace in our hearts, triumph in our pursuit is guaranteed. Chapter 5 Spiritual Sensitivity A believer who will matter in this end time is one who is led by the Holy Spirit, the sons of God who shine on earth for him, are those led by God and not those who stay in church. They are not those who preach 24 hours a day either. The Bible says that 
the world is waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. So we want to know who those sons are. God's word proclaims as many as received him to them gave he power to become the sons of God. John 1 verse 12. This means that when we receive Jesus, we only receive the power to become sons. We are just children. And the Bible says, Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be Lord of all. Galatians 4 verse 1. It means we cannot access our inheritance is in God until we become sons. Of course, it is our right to be on the throne, but the throne is not for children. The Bible says, Woe unto you when your king is a child. Ecclesiastes 10 verse 16. Paraphrase. Our rightful positions can never be ours except we outgrow our childishness. This is because thrones are for sons not for children therefore the subject of sensitivity to the spirit is crucial to our achievement of success because the bible classifies sons of god as those led by the spirit of god an eight-year-old child who is declared king only carries the title he cannot make decisions so you can only access the place God has for you when you grow from a child to a son. The power to be sensitive to the Spirit is deposited in us at new birth, which makes us candidates for spiritual sensitivity to the Holy Spirit. It is our birthright to be able to hear the Holy Spirit speak to us on life issues and be led by Him. Until we appropriate this right, we cannot become sons. The Holy Spirit is also the principal tool for effectual analysis of our vision. He tells us what is wrong from what we claim is right. He also tells us the faulty aspects of the interpretation. He is the chief executive for the analysis of vision. Our sensitivity to him determines the accurate analysis or otherwise of our vision. The Bible says, My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. John 10 verse 27 If we are born of God, we are expected to hear his voice, which is the voice of the Holy Ghost. Children don't have to go to school to learn their parents' language. The greatest dummy in the world naturally understands his mother tongue. God says, I know you. You are mine and you know my voice. My voice is clear to you. The ability to hear God's voice does not belong to ministers of the gospel alone. Everyone who is born of God has that ability in him. The day we became born again, a spiritual turnaround took place. This is what gives us that capacity to understand God's voice. Hearing God's voice is not a gift, it is our birthright. The men who have attained great heights in Christ today are known for their super sensitivity to the Holy Spirit. They are men of honor and dignity because they are walking in the plans of God. Do you know the secret behind the success of Jesus' ministry? He said it himself, I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge. John 5 verse 30. As he heard, he acted and he moved. He was in constant communication with God. When he was told about the sickness and eventual death of Lazarus, he didn't go running down there. He waited to hear from the Father before moving. We too can hear. Our ears are capable 
of hearing the voice of the Holy Spirit. A time came when the great man of God, Elijah, was stranded and he cried unto God to take his life. He waited for God to answer him and God did. God spoke to him and told him what to do. This took him to another phase of his ministry. Elijah got to his weak point and the voice of God offered him direction and established his office. 1 Kings 19 verse 11 to 18 Today, those who sweat in ministry are those who are deaf to the Holy Spirit. They do what is right in their own eyes and not what God tells them to do. It is very crucial that we are sensitive enough to receive from God when he speaks. Below are a few ways we can enhance our sensitivity to the Holy Ghost. Quietness. This is a notable thing in the experience of Elijah. There was an earthquake, a very wild wind, and then fire, but God's voice was not in them. When it finally came, it was a still small voice. The word still is worthy of note. There is no way we can receive signals from heaven without quietness. The word of God says, and thine ear shall hear a word behind thee, saying, This is the way, walk ye in it. Isaiah 30 verse 21 If God's voice comes from behind, then we need to be very quiet to hear it, except we practice quietness. We cannot understand the mystery of receiving from God. When we are quiet within and without, the Holy Spirit will always instruct us. He never goes on break. Let's learn to be quiet and receive instructions from Him daily. His word will come to us when we are quiet. We cannot afford to be deaf to the leading of the Holy Spirit. Stop rushing around doing things. Maintain quietness within and without and the mystery of God will drop for us. Worship. Worship is adoration. It is bowing down at the feet of God, hallowing his name. In worship, we lay down our crowns before him. When we do this, we are ready to receive from him. If we want to increase our ability to hear from God, we must learn to worship him. When we do, we receive revelations. And now bring me a minstrel. And it came to pass when the minstrel played that the hand of the Lord came upon him. And he said, Thus saith the Lord, Make this valley full of ditches. But thus saith the Lord, Ye shall not see wind, neither shall ye see rain. Yet that valley shall be filled with water, that ye may drink both ye and your cattle and your beasts. Second Kings 3 verse 15 to 17 As the minstrel played on the instrument and the heart of Elisha connected with God in worship, the word of the Lord came unto him. Today, a lot of ministers around the world do this. They ask for a tune to be struck on the organ while ministering to the afflicted. Normally, it is a soft tune that goes on and on. This enhances their sensitivity to instructions from the Holy Ghost. Psalms and hymns are very good tools of worship. I have noticed that I am super confident any time I enter into a deep realm of worship in psalms and hymns. Meekness. This is approaching God on the platform of nothingness. It means coming to him devoid of our knowledge and with the understanding that he alone can fill us up. God's word says, the meek will he guide in judgment. And the meek will he teach his way. Psalm 25 verse 9. 
God wants us to put away our ideas and receive his instructions with the meekness. When we do, we will inherit the earth as it is written. Blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth. Matthew 5 verse 5. So if we want to possess the earth, we must embrace meekness. Meekness leads to obedience and obedience leads to possession. Don't be too wise for God to instruct. Don't be like King Ahab who felt too wise and was too full of himself for God to instruct. He had no respect for God's word and never obeyed any of his instructions. We should make ourselves a Jehoshaphat who respected God's instructions and obeyed promptly. As we obey God and his instructions promptly, we will receive more instructions. There is no way the Holy Spirit will continue to give us new instructions if we refuse to obey the previous ones. When Elisha was called to give King Ahab and King Jehoshaphat a word from God, Elijah the prophet said, Were it not that I regard the presence of Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, I will not look toward thee nor see thee. Second Kings 3 verse 14 Jehoshaphat always listened to and obeyed the word of God. No wonder he prospered. When we follow all these hearing aids listed above, our sensitivity to the Holy Spirit will be heightened and we will follow in the realm of revelations. Our sonship will be sealed and we will start to manifest our position in Christ Jesus. Chapter 6 The Place of Planning No venture produces without planning. We may have all the materials required for a building project. However, it takes proper planning to put up the building. Every physical structure requires planning to be in position. A vision is a kind of building and it calls for planning to have it fulfilled. Apostle Paul referred to his vision, assignment, and service as a construction venture. He said, According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. 1 Corinthians 3 verse 10 This implies that our calling irrespective of the magnitude, is a form of contribution to the kingdom. It is a form of building. We are all called to build on the foundation which Christ has laid. Just as planning is most pertinent in any construction task, it is important to plan the pursuit of any vision. Planning is not optional but obligatory for any vision that will thrive. It takes planning to excel in life. Excellence is a product of good planning. Concerning Jotam, the Bible says, So Jotam became mighty because he prepared, planned his ways before the Lord his God. Second Chronicles 27 verse 6 emphasis mine unfortunately a great number of the charismatics have undermined the place of planning in the name of being led by the spirit while it is true that we are to be led by the spirit it is equally true that what the word commands is the spirit's command also the scripture says there are three which bear record in heaven the father the word and the holy ghost and these three are one first john 5 verse 7 again jesus said the words that i speak unto you they are spirits and they are life john 6 verse 63 therefore 
if God in his word commands that we plan, the Holy Spirit cannot lead us to despise planning. Even when God had the vision to create the world, he engaged the weapon of planning to make his vision a reality. The Bible says, The Lord by wisdom, which is reflected in planning, being the principal ingredient of planning, has founded the earth by understanding has he established the heavens. Proverbs 3 verse 19 paraphrased. Again, we are told in the book of Psalm, O Lord, how manifold are thy works. In wisdom hast thou made them all. The earth is full of thy riches. Psalm 104 verse 24. The world we see today is the proof of God's vision, which was activated by wisdom, made manifest by quality planning. All creation in their perfect order is an evidence of wisdom at work. There has never been a need to revert his creation. Surely wisdom produces perfection. A visionary is a builder. It is written through wisdom is an house builder. And by understanding it is established. And by knowledge shall the chambers be filled with all precious and pleasant riches. Proverbs 24 verse 3 to 4. As earlier stated, it takes planning to build. The quality of planning determines the quality of the final outcome. The Living Bible brings out the truth of Proverbs 24 verse 3 to 4 much more beautifully. It says, Any enterprise is built by wise planning becomes strong through common sense and profits wonderfully by keeping abreast of the facts. This is a very exciting translation. The subject of this translation include an enterprise. This means every area of human endeavor or calling is built by wise planning. This implies that wise planning is required to accomplish every given task. Become strong through common sense, application of all forms of acquired knowledge. Profits wonderfully by keeping abreast with the facts. There are related facts to every given task. For instance, there are facts about driving, which include a working knowledge of the gear system, the steering wheel, the brakes, accelerator, clutch system, and lightning system, ETC. If one is called to preach the gospel, it becomes relevant in his planning to know what message he is called to preach. The voice said, cry, and he said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass. And all the goodliness thereof is as the flower of the field. Isaiah 40 verse 6 A messenger without a message will never make impact. If anything, he will only end up a frustrated Confucianist. One of the foremost facts required for a successful preaching ministry is to know what message you have been commissioned to preach. The very next important fact is to know where you are sent, that is, the city and people you are sent to. When Jesus sent his disciples on a mission, he told them where to go. These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Matthew 10 verse 5 to 6 And God called Jonah to go to Nineveh, and he headed for Tarshish. He paid dearly for it. God sent Apostle Paul to the Gentiles. He had a very profound ministry to them. All the humiliation he suffered were afflicted on him in Jerusalem. 
why God did not send him to the Jews. In Acts 20 verse 22, he said, And now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there. And according to Scripture, wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. 2 Corinthians 3 verse 17 Paul had no liberty in his spirit to go to Jerusalem because God had not sent him there. God has a place of effect for the vision he has given you. Locate it. Chapter 7 The Appointed Time An understanding of God's timing puts us in the center of his program. Every vision from God has a divinely appointed time. The time you receive a call may not necessarily be the time for its takeoff. Don't forget our text in Habakkuk, for the vision is yet for an appointed time. Habakkuk 2 verse 3. The vision is yet for an appointed time. The word yet means the vision is not for now. The prophet Habakkuk sought a vision and he received it. But the Lord told him, Don't expect what I have told you to happen now. It will surely happen, but its time is yet to come. All visions have their appointed time, which is determined by God alone. God's time is the time of miraculous, divine provisions. It is the time of safety. It is the time of favors for accomplishment. God goes before us to make the crooked places straight. An understanding of this time schedule is a sign of maturity. Children hear things and want them immediately. They keep on pestering their parents until they wear them out. But maturity is having an understanding of all the intricacies involved in whatever we have heard. When understanding comes, caution is exercised and struggles are avoided. Maturity calls for walking in the center of God's program for our lives according to his timing. There is always a time for the manifestation of every calling of God. John the Baptist had to remain in the desert until the time of his showing to Israel. If he had stepped out a day before that time, he would have wrecked his mission. And the child grew and waxed strong in spirit and was in the desert till the day of his showing unto Israel. Luke 1 verse 30. Also we see that Jesus spent 30 years at the carpenter's shed. The Son of God was carrying wood and mending broken tables and chairs for 30 years. He knew who he was right from the beginning. He knew his mission. He voiced it out at the age of 12. Wist ye not that I must be about my father's business? Luke 2 verse 49. However, he waited for his appointed time. He heard John preaching the gospel of repentance, but he didn't rush out to start off his ministry. He exercised caution. He waited. He humbled himself and the heavens opened. The beginning of his ministry was declared and he went to Cana of Galilee. At the marriage feast in Cana, wine finished and Mary, his mother, asked him to intervene. He made a statement that everyone should bear in mind. He said, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. John 2 verse 4 Timing is very important in the pursuit of any vision. When you miss the right timing, the result is always unpleasant. After the Lord called me into ministry, I didn't step out for months. I can be very slow, but when I get God's backing, that ends it. 
at a point i began to sense it was time to step out so i decided to go to god hoping to hear his marching order i separated myself to ask for his timing by engaging the altar of prayer when i opened my eyes after hours of praying i saw a bright light in the room it was as if heaven's musical gadgets were turned on to release heaven's music the sound i heard which flooded the room was be in time be in time this brought tears to my eyes and i found myself weeping god had sounded it the time was ripe everything was set i left the prayer altar with a commissioning program set in my mind i knew who was to do the sending force it was a pastor i had never met in my life i got the name of his ministry and his address and wrote to him he replied begging to be excused because he had other engagements lined up in portacot nigeria on the same day as my commissioning date unperturbed i wrote back telling him that the lord said that his portacot meeting was his own personal meeting but that my commissioning ceremony was the lord's i had just sent my letter when i received another from him saying that the lord had instructed him to put off the portacot meeting to be at the commissioning we met for the first time at the ceremony but the lord had his way for the vision is for an appointed time there is an appointed time for take off there is an appointed time to move from one phase to another there is an appointed time to be at a particular place god is a perfect planner he has time for everything he has ordained there is an appointed time for the rain and another for the moon and the stars there is a time for rain and another for sunshine there is an appointed time for everything it is written to everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven Ecclesiastes 3 verse 1 In 1985 I thought the Lord wanted me to reach out to different cities in the country with the word so I mapped out a plan and pasted it on my board one day I looked at it feeling quite pleased with myself then the Lord spoke take off that plan from the board when I asked why he replied This is not my plan for you for now. I want you to do further digging in this place where you are. It is time for you to get your roots deeper into the land and bear more fruit. When it is time for you to reach out, I will let you know. I removed the plan from the board and asked for another plan for the year. He gave me a growth plan. through a sound teaching of the word and in 1986 we had a 91% increase for the vision is for an appointed time habakkuk 2 verse 3 every phase in ministry has its timing if we miss out on it we miss out on god and when god is not with us the end result is misery it will happier as if we were not called by god as a minister of god fix your program in accordance with god's timing don't go rushing off to just anywhere you are invited to when jesus was called to go to bethany to heal lazarus who was sick though the call was from his loved ones he stayed back waiting for divine instructions The word came only after Lazarus had died and was buried. He went at God's appointed time, and the glory of God was manifested. No doubt, 
the anointing follows God's timing. God is very particular about us working according to his schedule. The vision is for an appointed time and all times are appointed by God. When it was time for this ministry to open a branch in Lagos, the Lord spoke to me one early morning as I was worshipping at his feet. He said, Arise, go to Lagos and raise me a people. That same day, I dispatched my staff to Lagos to get a location. When God speaks, the anointing for breakthroughs follow. Without sweat, we found a suitable location for the church and offices. We also got residential houses nearby for the pastor and other members of staff, all at giveaway prizes. Lagos is one of the most difficult places in the world to secure accommodation, but walking in God's timing reduces tension. It produces instant results, and it is the only way to guarantee success in life and ministry. There is a place to preach per time. There is a word for each place. Don't go rushing everywhere just because others are doing it and are successful. We must respond to the time nudging of the Holy Spirit. If we are not sure of his timing, we should ask him and he will tell us we are soldiers in the army of God. We shouldn't go marching at our own orders. Wait for the captain of the host to give his orders and then follow. We should listen for his marching orders before we move. Obeying God's timing leads to sweatless triumph. Joshua experienced this at the fall of the wall of Jericho. He obeyed God's marching orders and the wall of Jericho fell. So the people shouted when the priests blew with the trumpets and it came to pass when the people heard the sound of the trumpet and the people shouted with a great shout that the world fell down flat so that the people went up into the city every man straight before him and they took the city joshua 6 verse 20 if he had told the people that there was no point marching around the city seven times on the seventh day and that they should do it only once they would have faced the greatest defeat in history not being obedient to god's timing may put a seal on our doom learn from king saul the set time for him to wait for samuel to come and offer sacrifice to god was seven days saul waited till the seventh day and lost his patience he couldn't wait for the day to end to see if samuel would come or not he decided to offer the sacrifice as soon as he was through with it samuel arrived and samuel said to saul thou hast done foolishly thou hast not kept the commandment of the lord thy god which he commanded thee for now would the lord have established thy kingdom upon israel forever first samuel 13 verse 13 saul's impatience put an end to his reign don't be like saul avoid haste when we listen for god's marching orders and adhere strictly to them we will prosper chapter 8 the appointed place every god-given vision carries a divine commission and there is a physical location a base from which its affairs are run where that commission can be carried out it is true that god is the god of the whole earth but there is a portion of the earth he has set aside 
for each of us. God's miracle supplies and encounters will only meet us when we are in his chosen location. Every commission has a base and until we locate our base, we will continue to struggle. Always get your location from God or you will continue to wallow in sweat and poverty. Remember Jonah. God sent him to Nineveh, but he decided to go to Tarshish. As his punishment, he found himself in the belly of a fish. He languished there for three days and three nights. When he came to his senses, he was vomited on the shore. And the Lord spoke unto the fish, and it vomited Jonah upon the dry land. Jonah 2 verse 10 Know that God's thoughts towards us are always good. Where he sends us to must be considered as the best place for us. He must have seen a need there for which he has equipped us to meet. I had every reason on this earth to refuse to go to Kaduna when God gave the word. I knew it to be an Islamic stronghold and the mafia headquarters. But I was not moved. Only one point was constant in my mind. God has sent me there, so no devil can be against me. In the final analysis, this is the only thing that matters in the choice of a location. Has God sent you there? If you can answer this question in the affirmative with all sincerity, then you can go ahead. God is concerned about location. That is why when we analyze our vision, we must take note of the subject of location. This is one of the things we must be very precise about in the details of our vision. Let's get the precise location for our vision from God. Covenant walk always has a divinely appointed place. The rate of success in any location is determined by being in God's exact and precise location. When God sends us to any location, he goes before us to straighten out all the crooked places. I will go before thee and make the crooked places straight. I will break in pieces the gates of brass and cut in sunder the bars of iron. Isaiah 45 verse 2 He makes his supplies and provisions ready for us. He prepares the people to receive us. As a result, we achieve outstanding success in a location where others are filled and are withdrawing. Where God says go is where your prominence is. If God says move to Katsina and you remain in Lagos, you will die of hunger and thirst. Lagos may be a land flowing with the milk and honey, but they will not flow in your direction. The place may be filled with your relatives and friends, but God will not lead any one of them to help you. When God strikes a covenant, it has a particular location where it will work, as in the case of Abraham. God said to him, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. Genesis 12 verse 1 Tracing the life of our covenant fathers, we will notice that any time they left God's location, they fell victim of negative circumstances. When we go to a location appointed by God, our success is guaranteed and our protection is sealed because that is where the angels of God will attend to us. When I moved to Kaduna, discouragement set in from people but I was not moved. I knew it was God's city for me. So when asked 
what I thought of doing in such a place, I replied to take the city. In response, some people said, Look, brother David, this city is impossible to take. If you make too much noise, you face being driven out by Islamic vandals. This motivated me to make all the noise I could. I was ready for anything. On a particular day, some men were shown into my office. One of them said, We have an order for you to move your church from here within seven days. It is a residential area. I stood up from my seat, looked at the man straight in the eye and said with authority, Are your mosques in the bush? All of you involved in this plot will be dead in seven days. The cigarette fell down from his mouth. He was shaking so much he could hardly pick it up and find the door. He got to the road and came back begging. Please, sir, I was sent. I am only a messenger. That was the end of the matter. God fights for us in our location. He sets his angels there to fight on our behalf. And every pronouncement we make is brought to pass. Apostle Paul was commissioned to go and preach the gospel to the Gentiles. His location was the city of the Gentiles, as directed by the Holy Spirit per time. We will notice that each time he went to Jerusalem, he was arrested. Jerusalem was his own city, but he made no headway there. Our location would be a place, a person, or a mission. Each one constitutes a location. The day we receive a ministry from God, we become a ministry gift. A ministry gift sent forth by God as a location. He has an address. When God calls us to pioneer a work, he will also give us a location. That location is our place. If he calls us to serve under a ministry, then that person is our place. To the disciples, Jesus was their place. He determined what they did at every point in time. Therefore, when serving under a ministry, the ministry determines what you do at every point in time. Oftentimes, people of God are sent to an existing ministry for training. You don't go there to determine what you do. This is where humility comes in. If you are not given an independent ministry, you will need to go through a private school of humility in that ministry where you are sent. If a mission is a ministry, that mission determines our location and what we do from time to time and from place to place. Your location is very important. So get it from God and get your satisfaction. Satisfaction only results when you are in your proper location. Let's have a perfect understanding of where we are heading to before we move. We must not let pride decide the location. If it does, we will end up in a pit. Our location must be by God's direction alone and our satisfaction, upliftment and future will be guaranteed. Chapter 9 The Pursuit of Vision there is a physical law that stipulates all objects assume a state of rest until a force is applied to it. The same goes for the spiritual. Nothing will happen to a situation, desire, or vision that we do nothing about. For instance, I heard the gospel over and again. But until I stepped out to act on what is required, that is, to repent of my sins and accept Jesus Christ as my Lord, I was not saved. Faith is dead without action. Positive action 
is the only authentic evidence of faith. Apostle James said, What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he has faith and have not works? Can faith save him if a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food? And one of you say unto him, Depart in peace, be ye warm and filled. Notwithstanding ye give them not those things which are needful to the body, or doth it profit? Even so faith, if it had not works, is dead, being alone. Yeah, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will shew thee my faith by my works. James 2 verse 14 to 18 I will show you my faith by my works. Men of action are men of exploits. The Bible is loaded with demands for action, and it shall come to pass. If thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe and to do all his commandments which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all nations of the earth. Deuteronomy 28 verse 1. It says, If you will hearken diligently to the voice of the Lord your God, which includes vision, to observe, analyze, and appreciate, and to do, act upon all his commandments, then he will ensure your lifting. He will set you on high above all nations of the earth. Action is the proof of faith. If you believe the vision, act it out. Step out to prove that you believe it. No matter how great a farmer dreams of a prize winning harvest, if he does not get a farmland, secure implements to clear the land, plow, hoe, ridge and sow seeds of desired crops his dream will have no proof at the end of the day his fantastic vision will follow him to the grave if he does nothing about it a vision without pursuit is mere wishes someone once said if wishes were horses even beggars will ride action is the word no action, no accomplishment. Actors are winners, and winners are kings. Yes, great is our vision, but equally great must be our drives. Otherwise, our great vision will lead to great frustration. No reason should be strong enough for our inaction. Those who do nothing towards their goals groan at the end. The Bible says, The sluggard would not plow by reason of the cold. Therefore shall he beg in harvest and have nothing. Proverbs 20 verse 4 There is no challenge free track on earth. Whatever reason will not let you take steps in the direction of your vision will ultimately rob you of fulfillment. For every vision there is provision. God will not reveal a plan without the resources to match. This is why I believe that a man has within himself what it takes to accomplish every vision he has received from the Lord. God's commandments are not grievous. He will not send a man on an impossible mission. This is why he said, Write the vision and make it plain. Habakkuk 2 verse 2 God has shown us what to do and we have received of him what it takes to do it. So run, 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 move, move, move. Let's take steps. It is within our reach, our gifts. A man is worth nothing except by virtue of what he has received from above. What makes it the gift of God? It is neither the strength nor the smartness of a man, 
but the gift of God. A man's gift maketh room for him, and bringeth him before great men. Proverbs 18 verse 16 The task we are called to undertake is spiritual. Therefore, the gifts are spiritual. Our spiritual gifts set in motion spiritual forces which create a way for us as we embark on God's plans and purposes for our lives. We must not trust in ourselves. Whatever he has called us to do will be accomplished by his gift. God's callings are forever associated with his gifts. The good news is the gifts and the callings of God are not taken back from us. God gives and does not withdraw for the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. Romans 11 verse 29 when God calls a man, he endows him with what it takes to stand in that office. Remember Gideon, he called himself the least of the least, but God still chose him so that he won't rely on his strength. There is a certain kind of strength that is needed to accomplish a calling, and God is the one who supplies it. We cannot do what God has assigned to us with our own strength. Look unto him and believe him for his strength and then his gift will go into operation to produce the needed results. In the final analysis, God makes the man and the ministry. It is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth but of God that sheweth mercy. Romans 9 verse 16. So we can say like Apostle Paul, I am what I am by the grace of God. What makes a man is the grace of God. The grace of God is a free gift. It is a merited favor from God. We don't qualify for it. In the callings and elections of God, our human qualifications are our disqualifications, and our natural disqualifications are what qualifies us. He chooses the base things, the weak things, those without reputation, and he makes them. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty not many noble are called, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and the base things of the world, and things which are despised, has God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are that no flesh should glory in his presence. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 26 to 29. I was the least qualified for a preaching ministry in my eyes and the eyes of the world because I was very slow-tongued. Now the situation has changed. God's enablement makes the difference. People sometimes complain that I speak too fast. Moses believed that he was the least qualified, but God knew that no matter how qualified he was naturally, he would fail in his assignment. So God told Moses, I am your qualification. Go in my name and in my might and get your job done. God is our qualification. Without him, we can do nothing. Battles are won by the grace of God. Feats are accomplished not by power nor by might, but by the Spirit of God. Each time Samson fought and won, it was always preceded with the phrase, and the Spirit of God came upon him. Samson did not pay anything to get it. In fact, 
He did all he could to lose it through promiscuous living. The only time he failed and was captured, it was recorded, and he wished not that the Lord was departed from him. Judges 16 verse 20. When God leaves us, our nakedness is revealed. Why? It is God that gets the job done. Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman watch it, but in vain. Psalm 127 verse 1. God is the builder of our ministry. He is the one who gets the job done, not us. He calls us and also does the job through us. Faithful is he that calleth you, who also will do it. First Thessalonians 5 verse 24 The Lord sent me to set up a Bible training school, yet I had never been to a Bible school. I had to settle down with him, and he gave me everything from the name of the school to the courses and their outlines. Some of the courses offered are not found in any other Bible school in the world. Without God, our strength is equal to nothing. If we must succeed, we must go along with Him. For us to be able to forge ahead, we have to be watchful not to stray from His callings. Let our eyes be single and be steadfast in its pursuits. Give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if ye do these things, ye shall never fall. Second Peter 1 verse 10 Be watchful to keep your calling. Avoid distractions. Keep your eyes fixed on your vision. Refuse to deviate neither to the left nor to the right. Take heed to the ministry which thou hast received in the Lord that thou fulfill it. Colossians 4 verse 17. Crowns are exchangeable, so take heed lest another take yours. Chapter 10. Conclusion. Consistency is the mark of champions. Everyone who desires to win requires persistence. Challenges of life are many, but everyone who dares to stand in spite of all odds will make it. All our covenant fathers had to contend with challenges and strong oppositions in the pursuit of their vision, but through persistence they overcame. The Lord Jesus Christ himself taught us to recognize the place of pressing in the kingdom or in the pursuit of vision. The law and the prophets were until John. Since that time, the kingdom of God is preached, and every man presses into it. Luke 16 verse 16. Anyone who must successfully pursue his vision must accept this as part of the deal. Pressing is not often convenient we will be squeezed roughened up etc but that is a sure route for anyone who must win the prize for instance apostle paul walked in the light of this revelation in the pursuit of his vision he suffered hunger shipwreck and imprisonment on several occasions at a time, he received 39 strokes of the cane. He went through a host of other terrible experiences that would have frustrated and discouraged any man. But none of these things moved him. He had the courage of a winner and pressed towards his goal. In Philippians 3 verse 13 to 14, he revealed a secret for anyone who must win. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark 
of the price of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Pressing implies consistency. Many lose too cheaply because they quit too soon. The name of the game is consistency. That is your guarantee for triumph and excellence in the pursuit of your vision. Prayer. Haven't read or listened to this book. I pray that every skill that has hitherto blinded your eyes from sin clearly be lifted in the name of Jesus. May you understand the unfolding of God's plan for your life for a time. And may God's grace be made available all the time to help you. I decree that you will keep aligned with the master's blueprint for your life, proving the vision and running with it at the appropriate time. I dislodge the spirit of insensitivity to the spirit of God and decree that you will be prompt in carrying out his plans for your life in the name of Jesus. I rebuke the spirit of disobedience and impart the grace to you to his will, no matter the case, in Jesus' name. Amen. Confession. I believe the word of God and go forth to take conscious steps in the direction of his vision for my life. I will no longer walk in darkness, but will walk in line with his plans for my life.